morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone, and welcome to all of you at this first session of our AI Tech and Policy Talks, AITPT of this year. And for those of you who are not familiar with our AITPT webinar series, uh, the AITPT is an initiative of our Digital Law Center uh, that we launched uh, back in 2020 uh, during COVID, which has the ambition to offer a forum for discussing formally cutting edge AI tech and policy issues and for fostering an interdisciplinary dialogue about them. And today we have uh, the great pleasure to welcome Professor Teresa Rodriguez de las Heras Palel, who is Associate Professor of Commercial Law at the University Carlos III in Madrid, as our distinguished speaker for this session. And Teresa will talk about the very hard and very important topic of automatic uh, automating decision-making in commercial transactions, um, and also thinking about a legal framework for algorithmic contracting. Uh, let me say from the outset that it is truly a great privilege for us to welcome Teresa today. She is now in Vienna in a hotel room, as we discussed before the session, traveling extensively, was in Australia, um, a great privilege because of her expertise, of course, but also as you could just hear because of her very busy schedule. And Teresa um, uh, is, among many other activities, co-reporter of a very interesting project led by the European Law Institute on guiding principles and model rules on algorithmic contracts. And as done in all the past session of our AITPT series, uh, the presentation by our speaker today, Teresa, will be uh, followed by comments that will be made by two distinguished commentators, which has become somehow uh, part of the DNA of our AITPT series. And today our commentators are Professor Martin Ebers, uh, who is the president of the Robotics and AI Law Society, the RAILS project. I'm sure many of you are familiar and with it. In your legal service offering. And uh, who is also Assistant Professor of IT Law at the University of Tartu in Estonia, where he's about to go, um, as we discuss, now being based in Berlin. And also a great pleasure and privilege to welcome Willem Vickers, uh, who is the founder of the contract automation and contract management software using AI, we agree, and also has uh, many other activities, including uh, being, as we discussed, the co-chair of the Groupe des Contrats Internationaux, uh, a, a very uh, important, relevant uh, groups of, of experts uh, for the drafting of international business contracts. So we uh, truly have a stellar group of experts uh, today. And after the session, after the presentation and after the comments, we will basically open the floor for discussion with our speaker and commentators, uh, whereby all the participants today are welcome to uh, join the discussion by taking uh, the floor, raising their hands, or uh, putting questions in the chat. Please note uh, that the session, as you may have seen at the top of your screen, is recorded, and we plan to make it available on the website of our Digital Law Center for the people who will not have been in a position to attend the session today. And uh, ultimately, um, for the sake of courtesy to our speakers and to our commentators, we kindly invite all of you to turn the camera on to the extent this is uh, feasible. Now, without further ado, uh, let me wish you all a very stimulating uh, AITPT session, and let me now give the floor to Teresa for her presentation. Thank you very much, and good evening. I, I feel truly honored by the invitation, by the opportunity to share with you uh, some of the findings that uh, we have concluded in many of the projects that I am involved considering the uh, legal challenges posed by the use of AI in the context of uh, contracting, commercial transaction in particular. So thank you very much for, for the kind invitation, for the kind introduction. I am very pleased to, to be part of this uh, tech and policy talk and to have the opportunity to share my views with the uh, excellent comment and insight from uh, Professor Martin Evers and uh, William Biggers. So very happy to, to start by presenting 
how from different international organizations we are trying to understand this fascinating phenomenon of uh, automating decision making and in particular what we could call AI enabled contracting, try to uh, distill what are the main challenges and finally try to understand uh, what kind of solution, in particular what kind of new and innovative solution we need for the purpose of enabling the use of AI in the context of commercial transaction. In order to do that, let me please start by uh, sharing a, a short presentation that essentially try to uh, visualize some of the ideas and, and provide a path, a roadmap uh, for the purpose of, uh, of my discussion. We're going to talk about automating decision-making. We usually uh, employ the term algorithmic contracting or AI-enabled contracting. What are we talking about? Essentially, we try to cover all those situations where the contracting party or the negotiating party is using an algorithmic system and that covered deterministic and increasingly autonomous systems, so definitely AI system, at any of the stage of the contract life cycle. Is not only relevant the fact that we are using an AI system in the context of a contractual life cycle. What is fundamentally relevant is that we use an AI system for the purpose of performing an action or adopting a decision that is going to have relevant legal effect throughout the contractual life cycle. So that could be, for example, uh, an offer that could be an acceptance of a counter offer. That could be an action such as performing a particular obligation arising from a contract. That could be a termination of the contract. That could be a proposal for renegotiating any of the condition of the contract. In all cases, we would be under the coverage, under the category that we define as algorithmic contracting or AI contracting. So far, if we look around in the market, we see various cases where the use of AI is assisting the parties, or if I may use this word, um, replacing the parties in negotiating, in performing, in terminating. And that is definitely is going to be one of the points that uh, one of the discussion is going probably to uh, highlight and set light on. For example, this case is a, a totally automated negotiating solution. This is a case where the solution um, not only negotiate, but draft, compare, and finally produced the uh, agreed contract between the parties. We could have more sophisticated, fully integrated platforms where all the contracting parties are involved and engaged in the same uh, AI enabled platform for the purpose of following all the different steps throughout the commercial transaction. And then we have a variety of uh, very nice uh, solution, essentially designed for the purpose of uh, consumer transaction. We could have digital assistant, we could have solution that assist the consumer in uh, comparing and selecting the best uh, offer or even most sophisticated avatars that uh, help consumer to uh, comply with uh, their obligation arising from the contract. But in all these cases, we have a number of challenging and fascinating legal questions. Let me start by raising the fundamental one. Are the decision adopted and the action performed with the support or definitely with total autonomy by the automated decision making, that's it, by the AI system that we employ for the purpose of contracted uh, purposes, for contracted aims, are they valid and enforceable? Can we simply apply the fundamental principle of functional equivalence in order to conclude that any action performed by the AI system is going to be functionally equivalent to the same action as performed by a human being. So could we really apply with no friction, a contract law, a liability law that has been conceived, designed, interpreted and applied as a human-centric set of rules? Are they working properly 
when we have an AI system that is indeed taking the decision and performing the action? Can we apply with no friction the concept of consent, capacity, will, mistake, fault, the idea of a contract as a meeting of mind? Can we really use this concept? To which extent we need to recontextualize or even to innovate profoundly in the concept and the notion that are basing contract law and liability. If we reply in an affirmative to the previous question, therefore contracts are valid and enforceable, still we have a number of challenges. And I will focus immediately in three of them that for me are definitely the most um, enticing, but they are clearly raising the most significant uh, debate and uh, conflicting views at an international level. The problem of attribution and the problem of liability. To whom to attribute the legal effect of those actions and decision adopted by the AI system and how to allocate the risk that the use of AI clearly trigger. And that probably leads us to a discussion that we may have in the Q&A session about the policy option that we should follow. Should we uh, try to find analogy as the best mechanism to uh, complete the transition, the transition from the existing rules to the new rules? Or do we really need AI-specific rules for algorithmic contracting? These are indeed the questions that are inspiring all the projects that at the moment are going um, led by different international organizations. Let me just very briefly show you the map of what are the organizations working on the topic at the moment. In the ELI, the European Law Institute, we presented first uh, a, a set of 12 principles that try to provide the uh, legal foundation for the use of automated decision making in Europe. Concurrently, we are working in the European Law Institute on an ongoing project that is called uh, algorithmic contracting that has two different results, two different installments. The first one has been already completed, and I will very briefly mention at the very end of my presentation, that is about the um, readiness, the adequacy of the existing consumer, European consumer law to the use of AI by consumers. But we are really aspiring to reach a second step a second stage where we will produce a set of principle and model rules for a total adequacy, a total adjustment of contract law and liability law to the use of automated decision making. But even more important than that, bear in mind that the European Commission is working on the topic, is not only working on adjusting and adequating and accommodating liability rules, but also is already exploring the need of new rules for the purpose of regulating novel forms of contracting that clearly include algorithmic contracting. At an international level, one of the most fascinating projects that we have at the moment is led by United Nations, UNCITRAL, United Nations Commission on uh, International Trade Law. And in the working group four on e-commerce, we are working on uh, formulating rules for the use of artificial intelligence in international trade. You need to as well include in several projects that are at the moment different principles that might be of relevant for the purpose of automation. But let me start by presenting the problem and trying to discuss together the possible solution. All these projects start from the same conceptualization of what an automated decision making is. It's essentially an AI system that therefore follow this very well-known process from the input to the output through a set of predefined implicit or explicit objective and uh, using different techniques or approaches that we would consider AI. But on the other hand, we should take into account that when we talk about an automated decision-making, we assume a significant level of complexity. It is an ecosystem. And this ecosystem where the participation of several actors is precisely why the question about attribution is not a simple one. It's not a simple one because we have a producer, we have a developer, we have a data provider, we have update provider, we have a deployer, we have a user. So when the system is carried out as expected, we have the problem of attribution, to whom to attribute. And when the system is not as acting and operating as expected, we also have a problem of allocating the risk and allocating the liability. 
That is the reason why the first, in my opinion, and fundamental concept starting from AI system is precisely this idea of increasing level of autonomy, this problem of unpredictability arising from the adaptiveness of the system and this capacity of, in, of in influence or, or, or impacting or interfering with the environment. All these characteristics, according to the definition of AI system as per the uh, artificial intelligence regulation, all these characteristics are relevant because indeed they are disruptive. They are distinctive enough to reconsider the application of existing rules in the same way when we have AI system. So what are the main problem? I would start by um, stressing three of them. The first one is absolutely key, otherwise we cannot continue discussing this phenomenon, is the validity. So could we consider that a contract or any other action related to the conclusion, the performance of a contract is valid and enforceable, despite the fact that no human being has been personally involved in that particular action? So as you can see, our guiding principle two, the Eli a guiding principle on automated decision making, we propose this very simple principle that we called non-discrimination against the use of AI. As a general rule, automated decision making shall not be denied legal effect, validity or enforceability solely on the ground that it is automated. This fundamental principle has inspired the principle that the uh, UNCITRAL Working Group 4 is taking as a starting point. As you can see, the bottom of the slide, this is the current formulation of this principle. A contract is not to be denied validity. An action in connection with the formation or the performance of the contract is not going to be denied validity or enforceability. So only on the ground that we use automated decision making. This terminology, or sorry, this wording solely on the ground is absolutely fundamental because we are simply saying that the mere reason for denying liability, denying validity is the fact that it's automated. But naturally, there are many other grounds that we could use in order to deny validity. Could be indeed a null and void contract. Could be indeed a null and void action. But not on the grounds that it is automated. The second principle is absolutely fundamental. And for me, one of the most controversial issues that we are still discussing in UNCITRAL and has not been uh, still reached to a total consensus. The problem of attribution and the problem of allocation of liability or allocation of risk. Why attribution is a problem? What I am trying to solve, the problem that I am trying to solve when I talk about attribution method or attribution factors is who is indeed the contracting party if a particular contract has been concluded by an AI system? Or who is the negotiating party if a particular negotiated negotiation is simply conducted by the interaction between AI system? So we are talking about whose actions are the actions of the AI system. Because in a way, what we are doing is if we decide not to use the mechanism of the legal personality attributed to the AI system, we need an attribution method and we need attribution factors. And however, this is not an easy problem to solve. Clearly, the need to attribute is fundamental because otherwise we cannot apply any rule related to the contract itself. And it's definitely fundamental because we use this attribution method as a way to prevent the parties from excusing themselves uh, the obligation arising from the contract. So I cannot say I am not bound by this contract because this contract has been concluded by an automated decision maker. So in a way, it has, a, as you can see, a two-side effect, a two-side impact. But the problem is how, on which factors to attribute. It is enough to say on whose behalf the system has been programmed, on whose behalf the system is operated, it's enough to say the contracting party bound by the action and the decision is the one who used the system. Do you think that uses 
as a purely factual action is sufficiently strong, intense in order to attribute legal effect? Shall we rely on the purpose? My proposal has been always the idea of combining two elements, control and purpose, or control and benefit. So the idea should be something along the following lines. The operator, the operator is using this AI system for the purpose of negotiating with its providers and has a certain level of control over the system itself. Talking about control in this context is extremely courageous, is brave. Why is brave? Because we assume that the AI system is plenty of characteristics that may limit or deny the capacity of control, opacity, autonomy, vulnerability, complexity, data dependency. All these characteristics could be considered undermining the capacity of control. So how do we define control in a way that is objective, predictable and recognizable by the other party. The third problem that I would like to mention in the next uh, three, four minutes that I have in order to conclude on time is about allocation of risk. When we talk about attribution, we're talking about attributing the legal effect of an action or the decision. For example, if the uh, particular decision is an offer, who is the offeror? That means attribution of legal effect. If we are concluding a contract because the system accept the offer, we're talking about who is the contracting party. So we're talking about the attribution of legal effect. But the third problem is about allocation of risk, allocation of liability. And here, I would like to mention two big problems that we have to tackle. The first one is, what are the different types of risk that we want to cover and how? The risk of mistake, purely mistake, error in a very legal sense. The problems related to malfunctions and defect of the system. And the problem that for me is probably the most complex one to uh, solve, the problem of unexpected decision. There is no mistake, there is no malfunctioning, there is no defect, but the decision could be considered unexpected, an emergent behavior of the system how to attribute this risk. Possibilities. We could decide to use the mechanism of non-attribution. So if that happened, if there is a mistake and or malfunction and or an unexpected decision, this decision is not attributed. No attribution at all. The second possibility is try to use in a very sophisticated and uh, original way, the existing notion of defect of consent. And therefore, try to figure out how the idea of mistake could be recontextualized in the context of the malfunctioning or the unexpected functioning of the AI system. And the third possibility is to forget about contract law and to focus on liability. The contract is concluded, even in an unexpected situation, even in an unexpected scenario, but we have a problem of liability. Naturally, a problem of liability that is not uh, solved between the two contracting parties that are using AI system, but between the party who is using the AI system and maybe the producer, um, defective product liability, maybe the provider, contractual liability, maybe a third party or both of them, maybe extra contractual or fault-based liability. So as you can see, we have three main problems. And these three main problems try to solve the allocation of legal effect and the allocation of risk in this complex ecosystem that we need for the purpose of using, deploying, and using for the purpose of contracting an AI system. Let me just conclude with a, a final comment. This final comment try to um, reinforce or recognize the value of the European Union uh, legislative proposal in the context of AI Act. And in particular, those who are um, accompanying the AI Act from a legal, uh, from a liability perspective. Because indeed, what the European Union is trying to find is a way to make the system complete, make the liability system complete, because there is clearly a redress gap in the AI Act. 
And this redress gap is trying to be solved by these two very interesting proposals, the revised effective product directive and the draft AI liability directive. Because indeed, the AI Act is about risk, but it's not about liability. In order to uh, solve the problem arising from liability, we need other instruments at the European Union level or at a national level. So in my opinion, these are the most important challenges that we need to solve when we're talking about commercial transaction. I promised at the beginning that I would mention very briefly the Eli uh, project. If I may, uh, Jax, uh, for literally one minute, let me Please, just, even thank more. you very much. Let me just make a reference to how we are trying to solve the additional problem, the additional challenges that raise when there is a consumer involved in this uh, algorithmic contracting scenario. As you can see here, we visualize very clearly that there are two, at least two contractual relationships that are relevant. Contract number two is what we purely call algorithmic contract because it's the one concluded with or by an AI system, a digital delegate or a digital assistant that for example is saying, you say, please find me the book that was recommended by my friend and buy it for me, or simply um, try to find the best offer uh, from the supermarket uh, in, uh, two me in 100 meter proximity of my home. And the system find and conclude the contract. And on the other side, we have a bundle of contract that we called contract one. The are the contract that we need for the purpose of uh, being provided by this uh, digital system that we need. This is precisely the use case that we are using for our algorithmic contracting project that as I mentioned before is divided in two installments. The first one has been already produced and the second one is in progress. And we are working on elaborating in more detail this eight principle that we have formulated so far in order to crystallize them into a set of model rules that could be considered relevant for adjusting and accommodated contract law for algorithmic contracting. There are many problems when we talk about consumer, the problems of agency law, can we really talk about a representative or agent uh, on the side of the digital system vis-a-vis -vis the consumer? Can we still talking about informed decision by the consumer who is not involved at all? Is the consumer more or less vulnerable? Uh, what happened about conflict of interest between contract one and contract two. So we are in a fascinating moment and we really need model rules for international business to business transaction with AI. That is the reason why the work at artificial at uh, UNC12 on artificial intelligence is absolutely necessary. It's absolutely instrumental, but still there are many other challenges. I would like to explore in more detail the additional problems and complexities arising from the use of generative AI, artificial, general artificial intelligence, and other kinds of uh, frontier models that are clearly available in the market. What are going to be the, the additional complexities if we use this kind of uh, AI models? And finally, definitely, we have to complete our work on adapting consumer legislation to these novel forms of contracting. Very, very happy to continue this uh, conversation with all of you and looking forward to the comment from our uh, dear colleagues uh, commentating today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Teresa, for this tour de force in like managing to keep the time and make this presentation uh, of a very uh, sophisticated uh, topic, which is also ongoing, as, as you mentioned, thanks to what you do and what your colleagues do uh, within this ELI project. Uh, now I'm turning to Willem uh, Vickers, who will be uh, the first of our two commentators. And Willem, I think you may want to also share the screen uh, with the presentation. You have the floor, thank you. Yes, Jacques, thank you very much. I'm very honored as well uh, to be among these um, reputable uh, professors uh, from academia and um, be here as a practitioner only. Um, I was uh, completely excited by the topic and uh, going into it, I realized that uh, it's helpful to make a distinction 
between using or conducting an AI and uh, automating steps. And then I saw Martin uh, also, who's of course director uh, of an institute, uh, which also includes robotic uh, things, which is automating uh, manual steps or, uh, in a way. Um, let me share my screen. Uh, first of all, Let's see, so this is, uh, you should be able to see my screen right now. Yes, it's perfect. Um, yeah, um, uh, uh, I, I would uh, approach the, the topic more from a business to business perspective, uh, commercial agreements or commercial uh, transactions from, from my point of view are those between enterprises, corporates uh, or organizations uh, that could be a government government, uh, or an, uh, a public, uh, public agency, of course, but organizations in uh, general, not consumer law. I would exclude consumer law and the involvement of uh, consumers uh, in transactions as I don't consider this uh, to be commercial. Um, um, we agree, uh, my company uh, does contract automation, and indeed we have artificial intelligence, contract automation, uh, we've um, made this uh, broader to include contract lifecycle management, uh, which you could say is everything that happens post signing of an agreement, so after entering into an agreement. And, um, and we would consider um, contract automation or uh, contract lifecycle management, CLM, uh, to be the process um, owned by, operated by um, one of the parties and the other party would be a guest in the system, if you wish. That basically excludes lots of questions uh, as Teresa has raised. Um, there's one of attribution, of course, uh, as Teresa said, is uh, one of the most important ones. We would, I would say that the, uh, all the risks involved in the artificial intelligence from my approach, as I sketched it, uh, would be in the hands of the uh, CLM owning or the contract automation solution uh, operator of the system. Um, when I look at automated or automating decision making uh, in international or commercial transactions, I would think of uh, that contracts involve many stakeholders and that a contracting process uh, contains many intertwined sub processes. And when you automate um, a contracting process uh, end to end, you would basically uh, chop each of those steps into sub steps and automate each of them. And then the challenge in the end, and I'm not going to uh, dig into that, but we could of course discuss it, is how do you get uh, end users to adopt an application and basically to abolish manual work and step into automated um, working uh, way of working. That's a change management uh, challenge, which is tremendous. And uh, there, there, that's, I think, a whole uh, different story, uh, not necessarily for now. Um, I would break down a contact life cycle into uh, six steps. Uh, you can see this, uh, this uh, uh, what is it, wheel as we have it over here. Uh, it's a uh, wheel as many. Uh, define it, uh, you would start with contract automation, which we would say is the creation stage. You take a template for off the shelf, you um, go through a questionnaire maybe, and you use clauses from a clause library, which are template clauses, and you tailor the agreement first draft that you send out to the other party. Then the next step would be transaction management. That is what you could say the uh, negotiation stage. Then you have for both parties or the, the parties involved, for each of the parties involved, an approval stage where internally, for their internal purposes, they would seek approval from the stakeholders internally. Um, sometimes that goes up to the CEO's uh, desk, who would need to approve a transaction because before you can start signing. Then uh, part of a life cycle, it's a very short part, uh, is the e-signing of an agreement. We all know uh, probably uh, e-signing since COVID started, because that's basically where it all kicked off and landed as a established technology. 
And then you have contract lifecycle management where you would want to have a repository of your agreements, where you would want to have an overview of your obligations, direct access to the um, uh, rights and obligations of the organization that entered into the agreement. And what I uh, see uh, with the introduction of artificial intelligence, uh, it comes in at two points, but uh, at the CLM part, contract lifecycle management part, post signing, um, there you can see that Artificial intelligence, as we've seen it uh, entering the, 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 the field uh, with uh, ChatGPT, uh, GPT-4 Turbo is now available in the market, uh, is that it is so incredibly powerful that uh, you can easily extract data from your signed agreement or from the first version for the analysis of the agreement, so powerful and so extensive that it becomes very easy to elevate your contact lifecycle management to a higher level. I'll come back to, uh, to that at later stage. And then the sixth step of um, uh, the process, uh, contact lifecycle, is where you have a portfolio of agreements and where you want to sell the company with the portfolio of contracts or when you, where you need to analyze your full set of uh, signed agreements for whether you have assumed certain rights or obligations uh, uh, somewhere in those agreements. And there you would need to have a portfolio evaluation, which includes um, reporting. Now let's uh, quickly step through these uh, steps. Uh, through these steps in contract automation, I think the uh, the creation stage of a first draft agreement is mostly related to is mostly a process that you can automate and where artificial intelligence has a limited um, scope, uh, at least uh, for the time being, although uh, improvements can be reached. Then, if you do receive the first draft agreement from the other party, then what you would do is you would throw it into an artificial intelligence um, a model like ChatGPT, for example, or like GPT, um, and you would have it reviewed for a number of parameters uh, that you define yourself and you prompt that, as it is called, to the AI model. And it returns the findings uh, and it highlights in the draft agreement where, in which clauses that is, and how the AI system came to its uh, conclusions about, uh, about what it found. Um, I already mentioned that approval workflows uh, have to do with uh, the stage that each of the parties internally need to decide, do we want to enter into this agreement? And are we willing to assume this and this type of obligations and uh, to assume the responsibility related to that? And then you have uh, that the negotiation team must hand over the signed agreement and tell the people from the operations um, how they need to perform the obligations under the agreement. And then what you would uh, see uh, being useful is that the AI system creates a summary of uh, the transaction documentation. And uh, that could be partly automated, of course, by automatically involving the right teams upon uh, contract handover and the AI to summarize uh, certain obligations uh, to some extent. Um, and then you have the registration process where and uh, that's truly with, with AI where you would extract data from the reviewed agreement. And uh, the same applies for uh, portfolio analysis. I'm going to uh, step um, a little bit uh, quick through my next uh, slides. Uh, what you would see in the contract uh, automation stage for the creation of an, uh, an agreement is that you can automate many of the Q&A answers given during a questionnaire. Uh, typically, you go through a questionnaire, whether that's uh, uh, or that, that would be on, uh, on the screen, and you would see your contract appear on the screen real time as you answer Q&A questions. Um, you can have, of course, uh, automating contract automation or uh, contract creation uh, could, of course, involve that lots of Q&A questions are answered by an external system. I think of an ERP, enterprise resource um, um, platform, or a contact uh, con a CRM, where party details and transaction-related details may um, reside, and that you put them fully automatically as answers in the Q&A in the questionnaire. Then you would um, uh, optimize the agreement by plugging in clauses that you have uh, in your clause library. And then uh, you might invite the counterparty to, as guest user in the system, to um, to uh, to answer questions that are which are more relevant 
uh, for them to be answered. And you would then have your negotiation as to whether you would want to um, conduct according to certain policies that you have in the questionnaire. And you generate your first draft. This is what it may, may look like if you have a services agreement. Um, you have uh, key questions like, what is the purpose of the agreement? Uh, do you need to secondment of individuals? Or, or do you have a, a project structure of services that result in the creation of a work, whatever that may be, or even more advanced, where the work is created in several stages, so according to several milestones. Um, you would see your contract um, uh, being created real time as you go uh, through the questionnaire. Um, if, it, uh, if you receive the agreement from a third party, then it uh, works uh, slightly different, uh, differently. You would, you would not know the text, of course. It's your first time that you see the, the, the document. But there, um, you can go a step further than automation. Actually, automation doesn't say much. You would really have artificial intelligence here to help you identify where in the agreement is what written. Uh, uh, the, the AI can easily identify clauses, phrases, provisions in the agreement and say, here it says that the contract starts on the 1st of January 2024, and it is uh, uh, for the duration of three years or so. It may as well uh, assign a risk assessment. Uh, while the artificial intelligence could do that for you, uh, my experience is that you really get a, a, a hardly workable risk assessment because if you receive a first draft agreement from the counterparty without the party details uh, being filled in, which is a quite regular uh, thing to happen, then um, and the strange thing is that the AI will warn you that a party and, and a, a contract signed without identifying the party is very dangerous because you don't know who has to perform. And that's a very obvious thing uh, to happen, of course. And if that's marked as a high risk, which makes sense to some extent, um, then, then you get really a review and risk assessment of your agreement, which goes uh, to assessing and rating the risks of not including the boilerplate clauses. And I don't think that is very helpful. So what we do at We Agree, uh, or what, what, I, what I think is proper is that you automate the risk assessment. You don't let the AI determine what the risks uh, are, but you determine yourself on the basis of anticipating what you uh, expect in such agreement to be found, that you yourself um, allocate a certain risk level to uh, that clause. Think of uh, distribution agreements, for example, where uh, the long stop, if you are a dominant market party, then you have competition law restraints and you would not want to have minimum purchase obligations, uh, a, a duration that may extend beyond five years uh, in, in those uh, type of uh, context, uh, if you are located in the EU. So here you would say uh, that the risk assessment is what you predefine yourself and you anticipate the options that you might, uh, that you uh, that you expect to find in the agreement and you apply the risk assessment automatically to the findings of the AI. And then you would add your own clauses, you would fine tune the wording and here is where the negotiation starts. Here's a screen where, uh, where you can see uh, the clauses to be found and here, um, for example, it identified that there's a non-exclusive uh, agreement uh, that's a, uh, what, what you find out of the wording 2.2, that the distributor is, a ship is non-exclusive. Typically, that's a no-risk uh, element, uh, of course. Um, approval workflows is a funny one. Uh, I think uh, there's little to be automated over here other than that you trigger or involve the right persons to approve uh, part of the transaction, uh, uh, partly or entirely automatically. But the approval itself, by it, its nature, is something that you uh, would not uh, have uh, automated by an AI, because the idea is that the CEO has to sign off uh, for a certain transaction, or a controller, a financial controller, or people from the development uh, uh, departments to sign off on certain things. And that is something that, um, that, that either you have foreseen it in your questionnaire, and then it applies by virtue of answering the questionnaire automatically, or you need an approval of someone who says, okay, we're going to schedule it uh, here. So this is not something that I see is much um, AI or, um, uh, driven, but rather 
uh, automated. And what I see um, with the artificial intelligence uh, happening, uh, and it's actually rather happening with the more and more uh, the world becoming IT and SaaS or uh, software driven, is that the security risks, uh, of course, and um, parties and uh, I mean we've all seen the data breach. Uh, uh, news uh, in every country, uh, most likely, about a large um, large data breach breaches happening. Um, this is something that organizations are formalizing in the framework of cybersecurity and IT um, and security. And what I see is that um, you would need to make an assessment of the risks involved. And what I see with the introduction of artificial intelligence is that you also want, as much as possible, apply according to a standard method, how and when or what is acceptable as a risk. And if you then break down the types of risk that you can conceive in the context of any given agreement, of course, you have the commercial risk. Um, do you want to step into an agreement with a little uh, profit margin? You have the financial risks involved being uh, do we uh, do we rely on the counterparty's ability to, uh, to to pay its obligations timely? Operational risks uh, that the manufacturing facilities break down, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we have all kinds of risk, and each one of them you would assess them. And the quite uh, straightforward and commonly applied um, methodology for risk uh, assessments is uh, that you set off the risk, determine the risk exposure by setting off the likelihood that the risk materializes against the potential impacts. And then according to the outcome, and you have a little table over here, you would need to remedy uh, those risks or you would need to find, um, uh, mitigate the, 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 the risk, the exposure um, by any means uh, possible. Now, uh, of course, if you have an AI to assess the risks involved in an agreement, then you would want to uh, get to a level where you quantify the risks as much as possible, because if you get to an automated system of um, uh, contracting, then you, you will be working with computers rather than someone who sits back and says, well, this is a high risk or it's a low risk or whatever. Um, that could look uh, uh, something like this where uh, approvers are involved and would need to approve whether a change of control clause is acceptable, whether exclusivity was acceptable or not, or whether a sales high value contract is something that the company would want to assume. Uh, um, and then it needs to pass the table of uh, BU controllers, control, uh, senior controllers, or even the CFO of the organization. And they can have a discussion whether they accept uh, such, uh, such risks or such parameters uh, in their approval. I already discussed the um, delivery. Um, CLM contract uh, registration is basically a means where you extract data from a signed agreement. Basically, that's uh, the AI to read the agreement and to pinpoint whether an agreement is exclusive, whether a starting date, end date, et cetera, et cetera, uh, would be. Uh, I think that's um, uh, pretty straightforward and the most illustrative way of how artificial intelligence would work. Um, a condition for uh, an automated system is, of course, that you have proper data exchange, uh, you, uh, you would work uh, with an, what is called API integration. Uh, it's a very technical term. Basically, it means that uh, data can be in several applications uh, across the uh, enterprise in the IT landscape of the uh, one party or the other party. And you want to pull those data or you want to push those data into the questionnaire or into the system where you manage your agreements. And when you have retrieved them or extracted those data, data from the uh, agreement, you may want to push those data back into uh, other solutions. And uh, an, a proper functioning uh, API is, I think, a condition for a proper uh, automated, um, uh, automated decision-making in commercial uh, transactions altogether. And then uh, when you get to a, um, 
portfolio level, I already mentioned it, you would want to see, uh, um, want to be able to monitor and if possible, visualize um, uh, your uh, portfolio of contracts. And you would want to see uh, how many parties, uh, counterparties there are in Germany, in France, uh, Switzerland is empty, uh, by the way, uh, Jacques uh, in, in this example. And uh, you may want to see how many contracts have been made in which month. Uh, you would want to see metrics uh, which may allow you to optimize processes, whether that's a matter of automating the electronic part of it or whether to encourage people to uh, approve faster. Here's the metric of the average time to approval being here measured at four hours and five minutes or um, to accelerate the average time to e-signing, whether people in the organization slow down the closure of a deal um, because they don't uh, do their e-signing in time. It's here one hour and 30 minutes. Of course, that's because we have demo data where we do this uh, rather quickly. Um, but in reality, this is probably ne never uh, one hour, but several days on average. Um, so as I started, contracts involve many stakeholders. Automation means that you involve each of those stakeholders in, as much as possible in an automated fashion. Uh, email is still um, properly functioning uh, medium and the contracting process um, uh, should be broken down in many, uh, in, in, in as small as possible, automatable, maybe AI conductable, uh, sub-process steps um, enabling to automate an entire commercial transaction. So accelerating a transaction means automating every sub, uh, such sub-process and as we have embraced it to create flow in uh, conducting business. That was uh, what I wanted to say. Um, Thanks. Happy to hear your thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Willem. Before we shall turn to uh, Professor Martin Ebris, uh, perhaps Teresa, you may want to react to what Willem has just said, or someone else would have a question before we shall continue. Yeah, thank, turn you. To... thank you very much for giving me the, uh, the floor. Uh, fascinating um, description of uh, the solution that you, you implement. It's very interesting in particular for me has been particularly, especially um, revealing the fact that uh, you don't only, not only automate, but also assume that AI systems are applicable, they are needed, and therefore we are purely talking about AI enabled uh, contracting. So I think that this is a, an excellent idea that we are advocating for in, in our project. The second point that I raised my, catch my attention clearly is this this idea of uh, using uh, AI and automation once the contract is signed. So what I would like to confirm with you, William, if I may, is to which extent you believe that in the the scenario that you have described, the AI system adopt any decision with contractual fact. So. Uh, all this fascinating application of AI review, AI summary, AI comparison that are definitely extremely useful. Um, do you believe or do you assume that any of the uses of AI uh, is indeed uh, taking a decision that may have a legally binding character, such as um, deciding whether to conclude or not, deciding whether to accept this particular clause or deciding to remove this clause that is not acceptable for my client, but replace it by as a solution or even to propose a specific equilibrium uh, within the contract. If I may ask the, this question to you, uh, I would very much appreciate your, your comment on that. Thank you, Therese. It's a very important question. It, and it relates to uh, do uh, lawyers want to embrace artificial intelligence or technology altogether? And, uh, and I, uh, my answer would be, uh, this is quite a struggle. Uh, uh, what we see happening in reality is that you know, you knowingly step into a review process of an agreement manually, and you know that it will take you three or four hours um, rationally. And you, and you also know that answering a questionnaire and generating a similar or the same uh, agreement takes you 20 minutes. And yet what we see 
people step into the manual process. Five hours. They don't want to say four and a half hours. And this is something that is goes so much against uh, the, the emotional element of uh, adopting technology that um, I fear that if you look at uh, transaction as I described it, uh, before a lawyer would uh, deliver itself to a system altogether and not look into the details and not look up the clauses that were written there, um, we're, we are far from that. Um, but uh, and I do see that this may happen in a consumer context. So that's uh, the, the one that you described. I wouldn't consider that to be commercial transaction though. And what I do see also is that um, if you have managed warehousing where supplier managed, um, uh, supplier managed uh, um, warehouses at the customer side, then you, see, you may see large, le uh, large level of automation where probably even AI conducts analysis. And here, the, uh, what I would think uh, uh, happens is that both parties uh, would uh, agree in advance on who, who is responsible for the errors that may occur. And even though there is a clear um, allocation of risk for example, to the disadvantage of the supplier, you will in reality see that the parties uh, would want to work together and that they accept uh, that things uh, go wrong and, and that they accept that human beings are not involved. And that's, of course, to some extent in the, the world of large corporates uh, who, who like to work together and who understand that jumping on an error uh, maybe uh, maybe fruitful for getting the, the, the damages of that error uh, paid, but where the reality is rather uh, taken on a long term um, working together, long term suppliership, where you have these errors, they are part of the fact of life in a way. Um, but that is of course not the legal answer. Perhaps in, interrupt, sorry, so that we have time and sufficient time. I know we we're saying that so. The goal is to accelerate. I don't want to accelerate and put anyone under pressure, but I think it would be good for us to now turn to my authorizer's presentation. Martin, you have the floor. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, after this discussion that has already started, uh, it uh, might uh, come along a little bit theoretical, uh, what I will try to do, uh, in that I go back a little bit uh, to the basic questions that uh, Teresa raised at the very uh, beginning. And uh, when we talk about uh, this um, whole phenomenon, I think one uh, thing that remains uh, to me a little bit unclear um, after what I have heard uh, so far uh, is whether uh, we talk about automated forms um, of uh, contracting uh, or uh, forms by AI systems are being used in uh, the sense of machine uh, learning uh, based uh, systems um, and uh, including also natural language uh, processing. So especially um, the large language um, models that are uh, being used. Because um, I think uh, when uh, Teresa at the very beginning of her talk uh, raised um, um, rightfully the question uh, whether we uh, can draw analogies in the law or whether we need uh, new uh, rules, then the form of analogies I think we can draw, um, but also uh, the form of new rules that we might need pretty much uh, depend on this basic question. So I think that um, systems that are based on machine uh, learning and uh, also natural language uh, processing uh, included, they uh, raise specific um, questions, mainly uh, because then we do not know whether uh, we treat uh, the system, the machine um, as a tool, whether we compare it uh, to an agent um, and so these are very basic uh, questions. But let me share maybe my um, screen uh, first of uh, all. Um, so I think uh, what uh, we are witnessing indeed uh, is a major 
uh, revolution in the way in which contracts are initiated, negotiated, concluded, performed, and enforced. Uh, and uh, this uh, raises a number of questions. They uh, relate, I think, uh, to most contracts. Some questions might be consumer specific, but to my understanding, I think many questions also arise in the B2B uh, context. Um, as, uh, for example, the question, um, what happens if a company uses an AI system in the pre-contractual phase to exploit behavioral biases of um, customers where uh, already actually before a contract has been uh, concluded, one has superior knowledge um, of the other person and also this person's willingness uh, to pay. Um, how uh, to deal with the situation where a company then uses AI system for price discrimination? How to address more in general the problem of algorithmic discrimination leading to a refusal to contract or discriminatory contracts? How to apply the rules on contract uh, formation if an AI system is used for contracting? Also, how can uh, standard contract terms be included in a contract and how to apply the rules on content review if standard contract terms are drafted, negotiated and communicated via an AI system? How to interpret contracts when the task of contract drafting and negotiation is left uh, to software? How to treat, Teresa also pointed that out, defects in consent, specifically with respect to the doctrine of mistake and implicit fraudulent knowledge of an AI system. And then last but not least, what happens if the use of an AI system leads to non-performance or other damages? So do we need then to adjust the rules on contractual liability in the age of AI or can we interpret the existing rules in the way that we reach um, adequate uh, solutions. Um, from this rather like broad spectrum of uh, questions, I would just like to um, point out uh, three here in my very small intervention. Uh, one relates uh, to freedom of um, contract and uh, pre-contractual information uh, duties. Uh, the other uh, relates uh, to defects in consent and especially um, uh, implicit knowledge that the AI system might have. And the third one, um, I will give concrete example for the contractual liability uh, questions. And then in an outlook, um, I would like also uh, to address a little bit the relationship um, that is a little bit underexplored, I think, in literature so far between contract law and uh, data uh, protection law. Um, so when we uh, look at uh, freedom of contract, I think what uh, we uh, can um, observe is actually that there is a growing power uh, asymmetries um, because uh, the person, the company that uses an AI system has better bargaining power, also better contract drafting uh, power. And especially they are growing information asymmetries due to the use of AI system, because uh, one uh, party to the contract has, because of the use of an AI system, superior um, knowledge, superior knowledge about the market situation, but also about the willingness to pay of the other uh, party or other personal preferences. Whereas the other party, be it a business or be it a consumer, um, then uh, in these cases has usually inferior um, knowledge. Uh, it is often uh, the case that the other party might not even know uh, that an AI system is uh, used. Then um, how uh, the inner working of an AI system uh, is, is um, usually um, opaque. And by and large, we can say there is an inability to understand the other party's behavior. So if uh, my uh, counterpart refuses uh, to conclude a contract with me or just uh, offers a contract under certain conditions and then refers to a certain score, 
let's uh, think, for example, of credit scores, but also of uh, scoring in other fields, insurance uh, contracts, but also um, normal uh, contracts um, uh, for um, sales uh, contracts more and more also uh, use the technique of um, scoring. And that, uh, of course, then uh, leads uh, to the question whether we have to readjust uh, somehow pre-contractual um, duties because of these information asymmetries. Uh, so is there a duty of disclosure to counterbalance uh, this? Well, um, there I think I would draw, of course, the line uh, between B2B contracts and B2C contracts. First of all, we have the information paradigm in B2C contracts, especially because of EU consumer law and uh, most of the consumer law directives at EU level are about counterbalancing uh, the information um, asymmetries uh, in order um, to um, uh, protect um, the consumer. But even in the B2B relationship, uh, we might ask the question, what kind of information actually the other party is allowed um, to use to draw certain uh, consequences and then um, how to counter um, balance uh, here these um, asymmetries. This is my first um, observation. Um, my next um, observation is um, actually related uh, to defects uh, in uh, consent. And uh, there I would um, like to, um, as a way uh, to illustrate the problem, give uh, the following example that relates to implicit knowledge of the AI. Imagine um, that a company, I call this company C, uses an AI system to decide which properties to sell. And now the AI system is trained on historical data regarding uh, previous land use and sales uh, decision. And one factor that uh, indeed has a significant influence is uh, contamination. However, um, uh, contamination in itself is not a direct input uh, factor. Uh, instead, the AI system just uh, learns that contamination is a major risk um, factor. And now imagine further that the AI system recommends one of uh, the parties uh, the sale of a land that is contaminated, but it is not explicitly disclosed uh, here what the real reasons are because the factor contamination is in the algorithmic uh, model merely implicit um, knowledge. Well, in this very interesting um, case, we could of uh, course draw uh, here an analogy uh, to the agent, but then still we then have to um, ask the question uh, how to compare the situation to the agent. Is it then, of course, if uh, the agent has explicit knowledge of certain uh, facts, then this is also attributed to the principal. But uh, here we have the phenomenon of implicit uh, knowledge that um, raises um, these uh, kind uh, of questions. Um, to go further, um, I would like also uh, give you another uh, example and uh, that um, refers uh, to the following uh, case. Imagine the case that an apartment uh, owner commissions a cleaning company, um, again C, to clean his apartment weekly with the help of an AI vacuum cleaner. And then the AI navigates independently through unknown terrain by processing sensor data, using a deep neural network, recognizing obstacles, determining the need for cleaning and triggering the appropriate cleaning actions. And now imagine further that in O's apartment, there is a table uh, whose feet are modeled after the trunk of a tree. And now the vacuum cleaner mistakes the table for a tree further away and bumps into it during its cleaning activity. And there's an expensive vase on the table which gets broken 
But here again, uh, the error of the neural network was not uh, foreseeable from uh, outside. Well, here, I think in this example, if we try uh, to solve this case on the basis of our current um, contract uh, laws, we would um, have to ask the question whether we compare the system as a tool um, or as an agent. If uh, we compare it with an agent, um, for sure we can say uh, that the company would be liable if the human agent here knocked over the vase. However, uh, this company would not be liable for defects uh, for um, a tool. Um, because if uh, the vacuum um, cleaner, for example, um, in the analog um, age, uh, previously worked uh, perfectly and then simply um, explodes, then there is simply no uh, fault and uh, therefore there is no claim uh, in uh, damages. And therefore, in these cases, the injured party then has to rely on producer's liability. So here the question uh, is uh, whether this uh, system can be compared with an agent or with a tool. And I think then the decisive criterion uh, should be kind of the degree of automation or autonomy uh, that is then uh, decisive. Um, as um, a rule of thumb, we can uh, maybe uh, say the more autonomous the behavior uh, is, the more unforeseeable um, then it is also for the person, for the operator um, or for the deployer um, using uh, the system, the more then we can compare this uh, system with an agent and not uh, anymore with um, a tool. And then, of course, the other question uh, is, even then, if uh, we uh, say, well, uh, these actions can be attributed to the person who uses um, the system, the next question is then, what is actually the standard of uh, care? So do we then compare the AI uh, system with what we expect from a human being? Or um, would we say, well, no, this is not the right benchmark because uh, the very reason why we use these AI systems is that they uh, perform uh, better in many aspects than a human uh, being. So then um, we might, in these situations, have to compare the AI system uh, with um, other uh, AI uh, systems. Now let me um, briefly, as an outlook, uh, uh, also talk a little bit about this, uh, I think, very complicated uh, relationship between uh, contract uh, law and uh, data protection law, more in particular, uh, the GDPR, the General Data Protection uh, Regulation, because the GDPR contains a very interesting and I think very um, important uh, uh, provision, and that is um, Article uh, 22. According uh, to Article 22 uh, of the um, GDPR, uh, the, GD, uh, the data subject has the right not to be subject to a decision based solely on automated processing. So here the GDPR uses not uh, the term AI, but uh, that of automated um, processing. Uh, now, at first glance, it seems uh, that this provision has a kind of like narrow scope of application because it talks about decision based solely on automated uh, processing. But we all uh, know that in most uh, cases in uh, real life, at one uh, point in the decision making and contracting process, there is also a human being involved. However, the um, uh, new um, the recent interpretation of this provision by the Court of Justice of the European Union, especially in the recent Schufa uh, uh, case, uh, totally actually disregards uh, this word uh, solely because in the Schufa case, that was actually about credit uh, scoring and the question uh, whether when one company, the Schufa, uh, builds such a credit score and then sends this credit score to a bank. And then the bank 
somehow also on the basis of this credit score denies uh, to conclude a contract, whether then already actually the scoring itself forms a, a part of automated uh, processing that then leads to a decision. And the uh, Court of Justice actually was uh, affirmative and uh, said, well, what matters uh, actually is that then uh, based on this uh, score, you draw strongly on uh, this uh, score. So this alone was sufficient uh, then. And what does it mean? In practice, it actually means uh, that uh, they are data subject uh, rights because as uh, soon as uh, there uh, is an automated individual decision uh, making in the sense um, of Article 22, first of all, then the one uh, who uses actually uh, these uh, uh, forms of automated decision uh, making has uh, to justify it. But then also there uh, are the uh, rights of the data uh, subject. And according uh, to Article 22, Paragraph uh, 3, then the affected person, the data subject, has the right to obtain human intervention, but also to contest the decision. And then the question is uh, whether this also has to trigger contractual consequences. So all in all, a lot of open questions. I could go on and uh, on, but I think in order to have um, enough time also for the Q&A session, I will stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Martin, for drawing our attention to these uh, fascinating issues and topics. Uh, let me turn back to you, Teresa, for potential reactions before we can open the floor for comments and questions. And of course, to the audience, feel free, feel free to already submit uh, your questions um, uh, in the chat or get ready to raise your hand. This is the time uh, to take advantage of uh, the experts that we have with us today. Uh, but first to you, Teresa. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Martin, very much for your splendid uh, presentation. Many of the uh, points that you raised are of uh, utmost interest, and I fully agree with uh, your uh, insight and your proposal of how to, to solve, or at least how to understand the challenges arising from these, uh, these different phenomena. Two points in particular that I was uh, fascinated by. The first one is this idea of uh, attribution of knowledge. And that could also be related to the idea of attribution of information as well. No, um, it, It's definitely a fundamental issue. And uh, I don't know how we should tackle and solve this problem. So what should be the factor uh, or the set of factors that would determine this, uh, this way to channel or to vehicle the knowledge, implicit, explicit, the information from the AI system to the uh, the one that is maybe the operator, the deployer, the user. So I think that is it's a fundamental question. I will very very much uh, continue our our conversation on on that uh, on that issue. The second point uh, I completely agree with you, and and this is precisely my starting point is that we need to make a distinction between uh, pure automation and those situations where we are using uh, autonomous systems, machine learning, uh, definitely a generative AI and different model of uh, large language models, because there uh, the question of attribution and the, the problems related to uh, knowledge, information, how to attribute mistake, how to allo allocate risk, aggravate significant, aggravate significant. And that connect to my final point. I completely agree uh, uh, with you as well with this idea of the agency law is going to help us when we have a higher level of autonomy and the tool solution might be more convincing when we have a lower level of autonomy. Are we going to be, are we going to manage to draw a perfect line in order to know exactly what, which kind of cases what is the level of autonomy that leave us the opportunity to go immediately to the agency law and which ones should be solved as tools? So thank you very much for, for all these uh, insightful comments, extremely interesting. 
and I would very, very uh, look forward to continue our conversation on this topic in particular. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, any questions, reactions from uh, the yes. audience? I, if I may, given that I don't see anything, quickly react or, and perhaps ask a question to, to all our panelists, um, which I keep on hold because I see that Ivana Kunda has just raised her hand and I, of course, give you the priority. So Ivana, great to see you again. And please uh, ask. Thank you very question. much. Uh, I appreciate all three talks. Uh, thank you for being so precise and very um, accurate in what you're saying, I think. Uh, this is definitely that uh, a great takeaway from this um, session is that some things are really plainly, clearly said. Uh, and uh, I would like to follow up on the last uh, topic that everybody was engaged with uh, about how to draw a line between tool and agent. Um, because I was thinking, could we perhaps adopt some sort of presumptions on, towards one way or the other? Uh, because these techniques are often used in contract and tort law. And uh, because it is difficult to draw the line ahead, uh, perhaps a presumption could help in, uh, in, in, in setting uh, some sort of advantage towards one or the other side, uh, depending on, on uh, what we consider could be advantages for the, uh, for the parties involved. Uh, because that would somehow shift the burden of proof and uh, perhaps uh, at least for some time solve the problem. I mean, this is not unknown in most legal systems, such a way of uh, allocating uh, the, the risk also, yeah. And uh, I, I know that Court of Justice used it in many areas, uh, let's say even inventing it in some areas <laughs> where it wasn't so in the law itself. So I suppose uh, it could be in line with EU law as well. What do you think? I, I'm looking for some comments on that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ivana. Any reaction from Just... Teresa or Martin? Please, Martin. Um, yeah, spontaneously, like, um... It very much depends on uh, like what uh, kind of presumptions uh, you have in mind, because I think also AI systems might uh, just in uh, some situations uh, behave differently so that the presumptions that we have developed uh, over hundreds of uh, years and that relate to human behavior might not be uh, compared uh, to and might not really uh, work. Just to give you an example uh, from outside uh, contract uh, law that is more like a tort law um, related example. Um, so for example, if uh, someone crosses a red uh, light, we presume that this uh, person uh, was at fault. There might be situations in uh, where maybe the driver is not at fault uh, because uh, maybe um, he suffered from a stroke, uh, because uh, maybe like the people in the uh, car um, pushed uh, him or there was force majeure. But um, by and large, we would operate with this kind of presumption. Now, in a, a situation where we have a very complex environment and where we have interacting um, systems, uh, where we have an intelligent car that is embedded uh, in the internet of things or in the internet of everything, where we have smart traffic lights, where we have data communication between uh, different uh, cars and also with the back end, that presumption simply does not work anymore. And maybe Willem can also come up, uh, or <laughs> Teresa, with more um, examples contract uh, law related, where we can also see uh, that these uh, presumptions then do not work. I mean, yeah, presumptions are good, but then the question uh, is what kind of uh, presumptions that we have developed in the analog age still work and uh, where do we really then uh, want uh, to put them in place? Yes, thank you. Uh, what I had in mind is the presumption in between tool and age. So either we presume AI system is a tool and then you would have to prove otherwise. 
or we presume it's an agent and we would have to prove it. That's what I meant in drawing the line. We don't have to draw the line because it's very difficult. We know that it's on case to case basis. Often the assessment is made. Uh, so perhaps uh, we can, I, I fully appreciate what you said that uh, transfer, transferring the old principles doesn't work well. But maybe this, maybe just maybe it could be an, a transitional moment in, in law in trying to find out what would be the better solution. I'm uh, sorry, Willem, please. Um, I, I'm, I'm excited by the examples. And um, uh, one, one thing in the first example about contamination um, and the sale of this uh, contaminated uh, property was that it's merely implicit knowledge. What we would ask uh, through the software that, that, that returns a value is that you want to have an explanation as to how the AI came to its conclusion. And actually um, what is then returned is quite uh, insightful. Um, but I'm not sure if I fully understood what implicit really means because I also see that there's this gap uh, in that the model know that knows that it is a high risk, but is not necessarily inputted on whether there's con uh, contamination at all. Uh, and there may be the difference. As regards um, legal concepts such as mistake, um, under Dutch law, we are perfectly, and, and I think civil lawyers are perfectly comfortable to work with open norms and with uh, parameters like, uh, as this should be, in uh, in practice and allocate the risk accordingly and then have some examples in the uh, explanatory notes to uh, to an, uh, regulate EU regulation or ELI um, findings um, to to highlight how this risk fall from one side to the other generally my experience with mistake like my experience with imprevision is it hardly ever ever happens. It's 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 uh, zero 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 point zero 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 one percent uh, in real life that you have to deal with mistake or that you have to uh, have the question raised: Is this a case that uh, of changed circumstances that um, allow uh, a modification of the agreement? And I don't see how an artificial intelligence model deployed by one party who would then naturally assume the risks uh, associated with that um, should shift um, the balance. Although I find it appealing, uh, the asymmetry, uh, as Martin uh, describes it, the asymmetry of, of information becomes huge. And, and that is something that, uh, that translates really into as a supplier, for example, you know what your customer is thinking uh, because you have sufficient data and the analysis of data that's uh, of our times. We have, if I may be for giving you the floor to Reza, perhaps we can just briefly give the floor to Maria Preskaya so that you may react because I look at the time and we're almost... Uh running out of time. So Maria Briskaya, please, uh, you have the floor. If you want to react or ask a question, right. and perhaps then Teresa, you may um, jump on that too. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much, first of all, for the uh, three very, very interesting presentations. So I'm a PhD candidate at Maastricht University, and uh, I'm also working on contract and automation. And um, uh, a particularly interesting topic for me today was this distinction between automation and AI tools. And I see that it is sometimes difficult even to distinguish. So when exactly is the specific um so whether we have to rely on automation or maybe AI is more important in that specific uh, situation. And when we are speaking about automation, automation of specific uh, parts of uh, contracts, uh, specifically the performance stage, I immediately start thinking about smart contracts technology. And I was reading, for example, the draft conclusions of uh, UNC trial meetings. And I see that at some point, the term of smart contract 
is somehow a little bit abandoned and what is uh, then present is contracts with embedded automation. So I was thinking, so my question mostly relates to the terminology maybe to know nomenclature that we are using. So is smart contract something that is still present in the discussions or that it's just the term of automated contract is more preferred? Um, yeah, if, if Teresa could comment on that. I would be very interested. Yeah. If I may, that thank, thank you very much for both question very briefly uh, to Ivana. I like the idea of rebuttable presumptions, and we could say maybe the presumption, the rebuttable presumption, is that everything that happened with the AI, included all risk related to mistakes, malfunction, and expected uh, result, should be attributed to the person in control, and therefore uh, this person in control has the burden of proof. Uh, otherwise, again, we have a challenge. What do you have to prove? Do you have to prove exactly on the basis of the same concept that we already have? It's a problem of force majeure. It's a problem of, so again, we are reopening the debate. We are just solving one step and we need to solve again uh, the subsequent ones. But I think it's, a, it's an excellent uh, uh, approach as well to, to explore this idea of presumption. Uh, Maria, a very good question indeed. We have discussed um, largely and lengthy the idea of terminology, because terminology is fundamental, particularly at the international level for the purpose of harmonization, not to be confusing, and clearly comprising and embracing the concept that everybody understands. A smart contract has been, as you said, and, and identified very well, uh, put aside, because in a way was having a very singular meaning, and their work was in a way limiting and narrowing down uh, the, the kind of use cases that we were talking about. So a smart contract is there, but it's definitely not the scope uh, uh, around, with the, uh, around which the uh, uh, UNCITUAL working group is, uh, is uh, formulating principle. So here we have two options, automation as a all embracing concept that include algorithmic, deterministic algorithmic situation and machine learning and therefore increasingly autonomous AI. This is one possibility. The other possibility is to focus exclusively on the ones that Martin mentioned, more enticing, more problematic, more controversial, the ones that are purely machine learning, autonomous system, purely autonomous. If that is the case, what I see in international level is the use of AI system as it is. And if we use this term, we try to rely on the definition of AI system by the uh, regulation of AI. But it's a very good question because it's not simply terminological, it's conceptual as well. Very briefly, because I, I'm sure that my colleagues would like maybe to jump in as well. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Ivana. Thank if you very much, have, Teresa. Briefly, time, just, to, um, yes, just to say that I'll give the floor to both Martin, who has already started to speak, and to Willem, but for very brief um, uh, final reactions, if I may, because we are running late and I certainly don't want to hold anyone from yeah. other perhaps more stimulating activities like having dinner. Um, so to you, uh, Martin. Um, no, just very to, briefly, I would like uh, to also voice my concerns. Uh, when uh, we uh, draw, uh, when, when we now rely uh, too much on the definition that we can find uh, of AI in the AI Act, because it, it is rather a very broad uh, definition. As we know, the AI Act uh, follows uh, the revised uh, definition of the OECD, and um, it just refers to varying levels of autonomy yeah, without specifying actually the threshold that has to be reached to, to say, well, at this from this level of automation, uh, then uh, it is really so independent uh, that it is an AI. So it leaves this question totally open. And the other element that is also mentioned in the definition is that may uh, um, display uh, some form of adaptiveness so like after it is released on the market but it just say may so it does not uh, necessarily have uh, to have this uh, kind of feature that is my very short comment on this very complex question yeah thank you very much martin to you um so uh, i would uh, like to answer maria's uh, question smart contracts i think I, is a very good decision not to include it uh, first of all, a smart contract is not a contract. And secondly, it's not smart at all. 
uh, it's just an automated uh, thing. Uh, if, if one pushes here on the button, then something uh, somewhere else, uh, something happens. And the contract that uh, uh, organizes this uh, has already been in place as a, by way of a framework. Agreement. So I think that's um, a confusing element in the whole thing. Then as regards the machine learning and the artificial intelligence, uh, the AI system, I think um, we, we tend to think now maybe more in the line with the availability of a chat GPT, uh, where you can ask all kinds of questions. But um, the machine learning element uh, is really something that comes in if you build your own AI model, uh, even if you would use it in connection with uh, an existing uh, GPT, uh, for example. And the uh, machine learning basically highlights that the risk is on the side of the operator of the system. And uh, I would say where the machine learning is something that is being done by the, or under the responsibility uh, of the um, operator uh, of the system. So, uh, and, and what I think is useful to understand that uh, to expect an AI system to rationalize and to explain everything that it decides or that it returns uh, upon being prompted is not a two-dimensional thing. It's, it's, it's not even a three-dimensional thing. But for human beings, the understandable word, world ends, if you wish, uh, ultimately in, in four-dimensional thinking. Um, but uh, for most people, it ends in a two-dimensional or in a three-dimensional uh, world. If you work with contracts, there may be uh, hundreds of dimensions, which basically may lead to a hundred-dimensional thinking. And with generative AI, it's important to understand that if you ask the system at one moment to return uh, some, some value or so, a decision, if you, uh, if you wish, it is not necessarily true that if you ask the same question uh, uh, sometimes later, that it will produce the same answer. And uh, it will complicate matters if you do modify your prompt to the system by adding, please explain, because that, that doesn't work in three dimensions anymore. It works in hundred dimensions. And mathematicians are well able to to work with multi-dimensions and multiply multiple um, multiple dimension uh, things, tables, but this is really beyond human, uh, human reach. But that is not to say that an AI is generating or doing something of its own, really independently. It, it starts with data having been put into the system and the responsibility for that, I would say, is at the operator of the system. But it's hard to think in a world of more than four dimensions, anyhow. Definitely. On that note, um, it's my mission now to wrap up. I think uh, we had a wonderful uh, session. Thanks so much uh, to you, Teresa, to you, Willem, and to Martin for the stimulating um, input and discussion with a lot of food for thought. Many thanks also to Ivan and Maria for their uh, questions and intervention. Let me uh, also thank um, uh, Amir Joseph, who is uh, appearing under the Digital Law Center uh, name tonight. He has been instrumental in organizing this and other sessions of AITPT. Uh, very much looking forward to continuing the discussion, also to other opportunities to interact and to welcome you uh, at other sessions of AITPT. Uh, on which we will communicate uh, on social media on our Digital Law Center LinkedIn account. Feel free, uh, final point, if you have any suggestions or reactions uh, for future session of AITPT, do reach out by email uh, on the email address that you've received. Uh, now, um, let me all uh, again thank uh, in our name, our speaker and congratulate them for the excellent presentation and wishing you all a great uh, evening or rest of the day, wherever you are. Many thanks to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and have a nice evening. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye.